Good evening. My name is Michelle Yun Maplethorpe, and I'm Vice President for Global Artistic Programs and Director of the Asia Society Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Asia Society at the Movies as we continue our new series of film screenings and conversations that showcase a broad range of films and filmmakers from across Asia and the Asian diaspora. As part of this series, Asia Society Museum and Asia Society Southern California are delighted to profile the documentary, The Chinese Lives of Uli Sig, and I'm honored to be speaking with the director, Michael Schindhelm. This screening is made possible by Icarus Films, a leading distributor of international documentary films. Further information about Asia Society at the movies may be found through the Asia Society Museum website. We're delighted to offer this screening and other programs free of charge and encourage you to take the opportunity to make a small donation when you re register to support Asia Society programming. At this time, it's my pleasure to welcome Michael Schindhelm. Michael, welcome to our program this evening. Hello, Michelle. It's a great pleasure to be with you and to have this conversation. Wonderful. Well, we're really delighted and honored to be presenting uh, the Chinese lives of Uli Sig. And um, I thank you for taking the time to walk us through the process of how it came about and, um, you know, thinking about uh, the themes that are raised within the documentary. Um, perhaps we could begin um, by giving a little bit of uh, background on how this project came about. Um, you know, how did you meet Dr. Sig or learn about um, his remarkable career and um, pioneering collecting practices? You know, what made you interested in, in embarking on this uh, focus? If you don't mind, I would uh, try to go back a little bit to my uh, own history. I, I was actually born in East Germany and um, studied in the Soviet Union and therefore um, I have a long experience with communist rule. Um, when the war fell in Berlin, I was almost 30 already. So half of my life I spent um, what they call uh, behind the Iron Curtain in East Germany and for six years in the Soviet Union where, where I studied quantum chemistry. With the doom of the communist world system in the early 90s, China was suddenly a country um, somewhat isolated uh, from other countries which had before embraced um, this kind of utopian idea of a communist world. And um, I must say I was very happy when the war fell and I was very happy of embracing um, market economy and capitalism way the way it was at least at that time, speaking back uh, 30 years ago, I'm not so sure today always uh, anymore. But at that time, it was for me, uh, of course, a great uh, experience to uh, being able to travel, uh, to experience other cultures, to um, also become a theater director and later also a filmmaker and um, yeah, a researcher on cultural differences uh, across the world. And um, I always kept um, a certain interest in what's going on in China because of my background. So already early on in the 90s, I started also uh, traveling to China mm -hmm. uh, once in a while and to study what, what's going on there. But only when I um, worked as uh, the director of the theater in the city of Basel in Switzerland uh, since 1995, I befriended with the architect uh, Herzog and Demerol, a couple of architects who are today, uh, today worldwide known for in particular their landmarks of museum uh, developments like the Tate Modern in London, uh, and also quite uh, a number of important museums in the United States. Um, they, uh, yeah, we became friends and they shared with me once in the early 2000s that they have plans to uh, do a first project in China. That was what later became the so-called bird's nest, the stadium for the Olympic games in 2008. And I, uh, brief, uh, I immediately understood that this is not only for them personally, a kind of milestone in their uh, career, but that building is meant to be something very important. As a German with this kind of uh, dark, gloomy past of the Olympic games, 1936, um, where the games were abused uh, for uh, propaganda in the name of Adolf Hitler. Um, I know, of course, that the games uh, always 
were um, used for what you call global soft power, uh, presenting ideas, um, maybe also propaganda, uh, but certainly um, a culture, a nation, uh, and talking to the world, presenting to the world, the image a nation wants to uh, give itself. And I was um, at that time aware that China had become a kind of um, still a hidden giant, which more and more comes out of um, its hada. And it would be probably interesting to see how China will try to use uh, the Olympic Games in 2008 as a platform for talking to the world as a new big superpower uh, in terms of economy, but also politics. And that's why um, the stadium became for me a kind of narrative um, which I could use for uh, rather investigate the uh, changes, um, the transformation of the social, political and economic um, developments in China. Mm -hmm. So I accompanied the, the, the architects uh, from the beginning and I made a long-term uh, documentary about uh, this story where architecture certainly played a role, but it was more about uh, using architecture in, or in order to mirror the, the, the political and social and economic change in China during these years. And um, it was probably a, a very interesting coincidence that Herzog and Dömeron had um, hooked up with an artist from Beijing. His name was Ai Weiwei, and he had uh, not been known yet uh, to the Western world at that time. Uh, but he became, um, over just a few months, the main character of that film. So he was uh, very forthcoming to show me uh, places uh, in Beijing, but also in other cities, uh, explaining to me also what, how he reflects the social and political situation at that time. It was quite interesting to uh, see over the years between 2002 and 2008, also how the person I Will Wei had changed because in the beginning he was assigned by the government of Beijing uh, to be the immediate, so the, the, the kind of interlocutor or um, 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 interpreter, the cultural interpreter between uh, the architecture institute um, in Beijing being responsible for the deliver delivery of the stadium and the Western architects who created the design. So he was considered someone who could understand both sides, something you would not expect uh, to happen anymore 10 years later, uh, when Ai Weiwei had become a fierce critic of uh, the Chinese government. Fact, um, I think it was during that project that he really yes, publicly began yes, refuting. Yes, yes. Know, the and that's what you see also in the film, that um, while in the beginning, he was still very much supporting the effort itself at the begin in the end of the film, he even explains bl uh, blatantly that uh, I give a damn on the Olympic Games and I will never go and see that stadium. I will never visit that stadium in my life. So he had totally changed his uh, position. Uh, that happened uh, also in the course of uh, the shutdown of his blog he had at that time. I, I, we had become over these years um, a very, very popular blogger in China. He had millions of followers. Uh, people in China used to know who he is. And uh, with um, the shutdown uh, through the government uh, of that blog, Ai uh, Weiwei almost disappeared also from the public domain in China, which was for him probably one of the saddest stories and made him particularly angry also. Uh, so all these things were sort of in some way reflected in that first film I made in China, uh, which I later named Bird's Nest. And uh, during the filming of that time, were already uh, of that film, uh, in fact, already before, during the preparation time, I uh, was introduced by um, Jacques Herzog and Pierre Demeron also to Ulysic. Ulysic was uh, actually the mastermind of this connection between them and uh, Ai Weiwei, because he was already at that time uh, very uh, close friends with Ai Weiwei mm -hmm. and uh, had in the meantime lived again in Switzerland. So I met him in Switzerland. Uh, he lives there on uh, his own kind of private uh, lake uh, island uh, with a little castle. It was quite uh, scenic and uh, exceptional in, in, in many ways. And I immediately saw that this is a very particular personality too. And we befriended. And over time, we uh, became really close friends uh, and discussed uh, many uh, things 
uh, not only related to China. I, for example, during that time also um, for the first time in my life traveled to North Korea. Mm, uh, and yes, um, I, I, it's, a, it's a, of course also an interesting story because Uli Sik um, became at some point the ambassador, the Swiss ambassador to Beijing, but also to China, but also to North Korea at the same time. So he had also some kind of in-depth um, information about uh, this country. Um, so that's why we were always in touch uh, over the years, uh, also after the film was released. And I felt at some point this is an extraordinary story because I understood that Uli Sik was in some way, you could say, the man who, who introduced market economy to China. He actually brought capitalism to China. And I found this uh, the most ex uh, exciting thing. I must say, I was always impressed by his collection. Uh, I saw already early, um, while still filming the first film uh, in China, uh, I saw uh, artwork uh, he had either on display in museums or also at home uh, many times and was very impressed by the eloquence of these uh, contemporary artists of that time, showing all the kind of um, conflicts, uh, fights, uh, Chinese people had to fight uh, during the first decade or two decades after uh, Mao's death and the transformation uh, they had to um, experience in their country. So I saw all of that. I was very impressed by this. But the most exciting thing for me was that Uli Sik was the man who had actually set the first stone for building up a totally different, at least economic system in China. So that's why I found this is actually the material for another film. And um, later, I don't want to go too much into the details, uh, but um, although I was for uh, 15, 16 years the director of theaters and opera houses in, in Europe, and after Basel, I was running the operas in Berlin, but I found I have actually to go further out and to experience a more um, cultural um, projects and uh, uh, art projects uh, in, in countries outside of the Western world. So as I started working, I was invited by the government of Dubai to set up the Authority for Culture and Arts in Dubai for um, several years um, between 2007 and 9, which was the end of the making of that Bird's Nest movie and the, uh, also the, the uh, events of the Olympic Games. Uh, but in the end of that time, I was um, offered um, a consultancy job uh, as an advisor to the West Kowloon Culture uh, District Authority in Hong Kong, which was in the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. So I started in the following years uh, intensely working in Hong Kong uh, as a freelancer, advising finally the architect Ram Kohas uh, for a master planning effort he was assigned with by the government of Dubai during the time 2009 and 2012. Uh, so um, I was actually very close to, say, the software development of the West Kowloon Culture District. So what kind of theaters and museums to design? What is the purpose? How um, to imagine this? Uh, what kind of audience, uh, public space? the role of parks. Uh, of course, we studied closely at that time the political, economic, social condition of Hong Kong and the Pearl River Delta in general. As you know, this was the powerhouse also for making China what it is today in many ways, uh, because uh, this was the zone where many economic experiments and in some way also social experiments were ex um, introduced uh, to uh, the People's Republic uh, with an enormous influence by the city of Hong Kong. So that's why that was for me uh, a very interesting uh, point. And I have to say, coming from Berlin, which was during the Cold War, a divided city, as you know, um, and coming from the eastern part of Berlin, I have to say, uh, it was for me always uh, important that there was this other part of the city, West Berlin, uh, because I got, got to know about the world through the communication uh, in West Berlin, meaning radio stations, by the way, also AFN, uh, the, the American uh, uh, base, uh, they had their own kind of radio channel uh, during the Cold War. And we were, of course, in East Germany, and in particular in East Berlin, able to receive the program too. Uh, so we were listening to American radio already uh, in the 70s and uh, in the 60s. I got to know pop music, and I got to know even about news about my own country uh, mm -hmm. through such Western 
modern media. Um, so that's why the reality, the virtual reality was something very natural to me at the time when even the, the, the t term wasn't coined yet. Uh, and I found that there is a similarity with the position of Hong Kong um, um, next to uh, mainland China, because also Hong Kong was, of course, a kind of, I would call it a heterotopia. I would, I would call it uh, where, yeah, where, where, where now I have an echo. Now I have an echo. Um, I have a massive echo now currently. Uh, Oscar, can you hear me? Now it seems for that. So maybe I can continue. Um, so I, I, I felt that there's a similarity between that Berlin situation in the Cold War times, where there was uh, an island of Western, uh, yeah, say, free um, communication expression, and um, Hong Kong which also uh, represented a kind of um, different and independent uh, society in some way. And uh, of course, um, that, that made me particularly interested in, in Hong Kong as a city. When the M plus was um, developed as a concept, um, I met Uri Sigmor often again, also Dubai, by the way, at the time yet. And uh, I knew that he had the plan to give back his collection to China. Uh, I'm speaking now about the years 2010, 11. I knew that he had made several uh, efforts to talk to uh, high officials in the government of China. And he was still someone who had his uh, contacts to uh, influential people in the government at that time. And um, try to convince them that now China is actually able to receive such a collection and to put it on display in a national museum where it should belong to. And unfortunately, those attempts failed uh, at that time. And it was pretty obvious why, because uh, some artworks in his collection were still politically uh, for the Chinese government already at that time in, uh, unacceptable. And I must say, uh, it is probably good that it didn't happen that way because that was still another China, another Chinese uh, political uh, situation in comparison to today. So I don't know in what kind of trouble he would have ended up in case that um, China had accepted at that time this collection and what could have happened uh, later on uh, with it. So at some point he had to look uh, for alternatives. And I, I actually told him, why don't you um, consider Hong Kong? Because they are now developing a major uh, kind of new um, type of a museum, which is considered not only an art museum, but they call it visual culture, where uh, even fashion, architecture, design uh, will be included, which is maybe a very interesting 21st century approach to how to look at art in general and its uh, connectivity um, with, with other uh, art forms. Um, and maybe that's a place where your collection would be uh, in a very good position because Hong Kong is trying to position itself now like a hub for art and culture representing China in some way uh, to the world because Hong Kong is a global tourist place and of course also a tourist place for many, many Chinese people from mainland China who may actually want to see things in, in Hong Kong they would not be able to see at home. So that was uh, a little bit the background of the conversation we had at that time. And when um, finally, as you know, he decided to uh, donate his collection in 2012 to the museum. And plus, um, it, that was a great um, decision and uh, a major step. And um, I was actually pretty close to the whole situation and to, to the deal at that time. And you also the people on the Hong Kong side who um, finally engineered that deal. And so I was happy to see that Herzog and Dermeron, my old friends, were assigned finally also with uh, designing this museum. Uh, so, and I thought um, this coincidence has to be taken serious. And now maybe it's the time to make a second film, uh, a film about the story of Ulisik. So I made that film over the next um, couple of years um, 2014 to 16, um, um, and it became what I uh, what I wanted to 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 achieve, which means uh, again a narrative about the transformation of China, uh, uh, but uh, through the eyes of someone who has experienced these uh, transformations uh, as a foreigner and outsider, but in various capacities. In the beginning, as the first man. 
who brought market economy to, to China since the late 70s. Then in the second chapter, if you want, uh, as uh, a diplomat, as the ambassador uh, during the 90s, which enabled him also uh, to get in touch with uh, many Chinese people, uh, which wasn't uh, such an easy um, thing to do uh, still at that time, the mid 90s. So, and uh, then the final chapter, of course, the, the man who created the largest and maybe most co comprehensive uh, collection of contemporary Chinese art. So we brought these three chapters together and put it in another 90 minutes uh, documentary. And uh, it became like a second installment um, with the same cast, because again, I will weigh uh, the, the, the architect Sertung Dömerow and Uli Sik are in the picture of that movie too. Fabulous. No, I mean, I, that's such a, it's such a fabulous uh, kind of summary of this trajectory and the a very holistic perspective on how you were looking at the country and how you so, um, definitely, I think, synthesized what could be a very overwhelming, um, you know, and, and kind of dispersed topic or, you know, series of topics and really was able to distill it into this um, coherent and really compelling um, package, you know, and I think what you were explaining with the bird's nest, um, you know, thinking, taking this point of entry to, to look at a much broader scope of, of China and where it was. And I think it was so successful in um, the Chinese lives of Uli Sik as well, because, you know, when you first encounter the documentary, you think, oh, this is going to be kind of maybe a, a biopic, a di you know, documentary about this man. But in fact, you know, as you, as you just mentioned, you know, the first third really is more portrait of um, you know the recent Chinese history, and I think also the evolution of contemporary Chinese art, but um, you know again synthesized through the lens of Dr. Sig, in such a masterful way. I mean, it would it's really masterful how you were able to to achieve that. Um, and I wonder, you know, uh, through the process of of creating the more historic parts, or you know, the conversations with the artists in the really sick documentary, you know, how accessible were um, the archival footage or how open were people? Because, you know, as you um, illuminate in the documentary and, I, and as I think many of us in, in the audience well know, you know, it, it can be very fraught to speak openly about um, certain issues or uh, to raise certain topics. Um, and so, you know, can you talk a little bit about that process of kind of, the, the development and and how you um, were able to really kind of get the the meat of um, what's in the documentary to create you know an honest and compelling perspective. Um, For me, it is always important in filmmaking that uh, I have not only one single person in the picture and the focus, but rather a collective of uh, a choir of voices. Let me put it this way: of people who have maybe their own independent opinion on the subject I'm dealing with in the film. So that's why for me, um, already in the beginning, during the preparation, it was very important to ensure that I will have um, major Chinese uh, voices in that film. Because I cannot imagine to make a film about the transformation of China only from the outsider's perspective, regardless how deep that person was able to uh, get into the fabric of China. So, um, and that's why when I saw the collection and the eloquence of um, the artworks, eloquence in sense of how they speak to me about um, the political situation before 1989 and after 1989, the consumerism breaking out, uh, the, the, the new media, um, some artists comparing communist propaganda with commercial propaganda, uh, advertisement, whatever you call it, um, they have experienced the speed of change, the disappearance of history, uh, the mass culture, urban urban urbanization. So the major issues China and the world, by the way, had to face, but China in a particular aggressive and fast um, paced way, um, then you need to have, of course, people who have witnessed this from inside. And mm -hmm. I felt that these people who are artists, they obviously dealt with this 
and were able to express this already uh, in real time when it happened. And the artwork is we artworks are really like snapshots of this uh, historic period of the in particular 80s and 90s. So I um, ensured that Uli Sik would give me access to uh, some of these people. And I had long interviews and several encounters with uh, these people, with these uh, artists. Some of them, in the meantime, are big stars. Not only I will weigh, but others too. And some others, some of them become also um, um, commercially very successful. And I found this... Um, a very good starting point. Uh, I, I've chosen people from uh, three different generations. So there's one man who uh, was already a kind of uh, renowned artist uh, during the Mao times, a sculptor, and who was in his 80s. And the youngest uh, person was an artist in her 30s who grew up already with the first pop uh, music from Hong Kong. She grew up in Guangzhou uh, and all the pop uh, and Western influence had arrived from Hong Kong and from Taiwan in the first place in Pearl River Delta and in Guangzhou. That's why this was in Guangzhou, in, to, to my, uh, in my view, um, has been maybe the first place where many Western influences have agglomerated and uh, also had an impact on, on, on uh, uh, the, the art world. And as far as I know, the first real art show ever of contemporary art has happened, I think not by coincidence in Guangzhou and not in Shanghai or in Beijing. Uh, so I have these three generations of people sharing with me uh, their experiences. And I was not talking to them so much about their artwork, uh, but rather about their life. So I was rather recording uh, long uh, interviews and uh, stories about how these people grew up, where, what was the political uh, condition they grew up in. And of course, the, the old man had to tell me a lot of stories about the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the young person had no idea about anymore because she barely knew that it had happened. Um, and that's why there are very different angles and narratives uh, I could share with my audience uh, during these people because they had not necessarily the same story. They had very diverse stories to share about um, their own experience and also how they became finally artists. Of course, a major share of artists were from my generation, people who were really in the hot, uh, in, in the main spot uh, during the time when uh, art became a tool uh, to express um, maybe protest, but in the first place, express yourself in general. Uh, I Weiwei is also the same generation. Zheng Wang Zhu, Wang Guanyi, for example, and, and uh, some of the others. I, I, I had really very um, also um, personal encounters with them because I'm of the same generation who at least uh, have some, uh, with, with some kind of, uh, knowledge about what does it mean to live in a communist country, maybe even in poverty, disconnected from the world, um, not knowing the future, not having career opportunities, etc. That's all something pretty uh, known to me too. Uh, and I didn't speak Chinese, but there were always possibilities at least to uh, understand each other through Russian, ironically, because they um, still had a school and the first years also some uh, Russian lessons. And I'm uh, that's my second language, so to say, due to my st studies in the Soviet Union. So we had even, you know, things to, to share uh, from, from a different perspective. And that probably helped also uh, to sort of um, open them up and to share with me uh, a lot of intimate stories about their own lives and their sometimes anxieties and hopes um, during the time of uh, the transformation, uh, in particular, of course, uh, in, during the first uh, uh, years of Deng Xiaoping, uh, and, but also then the incident of uh, Tiananmen, uh, 1989. Um, also, that was a major subject. It was the same year when Berlin the Wall fell, as you probably remember. Uh, so suddenly our stories s split up um, yeah, in comparison to the Chinese uh, in Europe, everything changed, not so uh, in China. So th these things are all depicted in, in the film and um, really created a rather collective uh, storytelling and not um, a kind of linear um, uh, storytelling of some uh, one, one single person. Uh, another point was for me that 
um, you know, I saw in East Germany and in Eastern Europe um, how fast the old world disappeared physically. There was an, an enormous uh, revamp of infrastructure, roads, telecommunication, buildings, supermarkets, uh, you know, all, all that kind of stuff arrived overnight almost. And uh, all what was there before the gray reality of the communist times almost overnight disappears, disappeared. People were in the beginning happy about this and only after years realized we are missing something. There was something which actually disappeared too fast. And there was something like a phantom um, uh, pain uh, and people didn't really know exactly how to identify it, but felt it was too fast. We couldn't digest that speed um, and we probably will have some some problem in the near future with that. And that is what happened in Eastern Europe, in East Germany also, that more and more people were suddenly questioning uh, this political change. And I think in China, it was, of course, way faster even than uh, what we experienced in in Eastern Europe or in Germany. And therefore, it was for me very important to see what are the damages or what are the consequences? What is the impact of that speed of change um, in the social fabric? And how does that reflect and how does that show uh, in art and uh, in reflection and uh, in thoughts and emotions? And uh, again, um, it was important for me that we also try to I didn't want to reenact stories. I didn't want to, because it was, it is a film about 40 years of history. And when a country changes that fast, you can't reenact, uh, you, you can't go to places that easily anymore, which look the same way that uh, like they looked in, in the nineties, because even super mind, everything has been totally changed. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was important to um, find other ways to reconstruct also the the, vis the 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 visible part of China of that time, right? Because in a film you want to see things and you want to probably understand what it looked like. Right. And I was lucky because um, you may know there's this famous documentary by Michelangelo Antonioni, uh, who was on invitation of Zhou Lai in the in the eighties uh, uh, in in uh, China and made it two uh, parts documentary about his one one part in Beijing and the second part in China in the whole China. Um, and I found um, someone who was working with Uli Sik. Uh, at an early stage as a, a Swiss man who had lived for three years from 1980 to 83 in Beijing. And he had a camera. And although he was an amateur, he had actually uh, created enormously beautiful footage of the Beijing of that time. So I, I saw um, things nobody else, because that was at the time when nobody had a camera in China, of course, and the international yeah. media were not allowed to enter the country. So I, I got actually footage which was much greater than Antonioni's footage, a film, because he was, of course, everywhere controlled. But that man, he was free. He lived there and was able to go uh, to all sorts of places. And although, as I say, he was not, um, he was not a filmmaker, uh, the material was of an extraordinary value. And that helped me uh, to reconstruct the world of Uli Sig's time when he was as a manager for Schindler working there. And the second thing is that I've, we found a few um, uh, old abandoned um, um, places. For example, the largest steelwork, steel factory in the world in the south of Beijing, which had been moved at some point to Wuhan, by the way, um, because it was the largest polluter um, in Beijing. Uh, and th this factory was actually a city in itself. In, in the 90s and the 2000s, up to 110,000 people worked and lived on the site of that factory, 110,000 people. It was not just a factory. It was also, there were um, residential areas. There were even theaters, hospitals, schools. Now everything abandoned. So this was, of course, a movie set uh, uh, of an extraordinary value, as you can imagine. And we were able to get access to this place, although it was totally abandoned. And I took Uli Sik around there, and he, he, that was really a time travel. Where he felt as if he's back in the 80s. And so um, we used that material, too, 
We also went, uh, I discovered karaoke bars, uh, which still conducted karaoke the same way as they did it in the 80s, not in Beijing, but in Tianjin. Uh, that was another interesting story because I wanted, of course, to show that part of, uh, of the 80s and the 90s too. And uh, Ulisik was uh, telling me that after a board meeting, they always had to go to a karaoke. Uh, yes, I remember uh, that. Then, uh, so that's, that's, that, was, that was the way how it had to go. And he had to join, although he was a foreigner. Um, so that's why these things were extraordinarily valuable that we discovered these places. And it is interesting to see that even if things change fast, um, there are always uh, a few places which may be buried under the, the, the modern, the contemporary stuff, but still are sort of preserved there, you know, little pockets where you still can discover the time of the past. And that was uh, one of the beautiful investigations I could make during my uh, uh, film that when we traveled through China, we were always discovering such preserved pockets of something which was still overlooked and forgotten in this kind of uh, furor of, of change. Mm, fabulous. I mean, and I, I do want to point out also too, I think you were very successful in, you know, kind of when you're talking about that very kind of warp speed transformation in China and, and kind of, um, elucidating those losses, you know, there was that monologue by Chao Fei, um, where she was talking about her kids and, you know, they were eating foreign food and she couldn't experience the smells. But I think also too, just again, in your selection of, um, of participants, I mean, the fact that she and her father, you know, he was the socialist realist sculptor that you had referred to a couple of moments ago. I mean, this kind of generation of artists that spanned this period and seeing through their practice um, and their interaction with Dr. Sig, you know, how that shift has occurred in such a personal way, mm -hmm. um, again, mm -hmm. to make it more pal palatable for people. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, again, you know, like thinking about Dr. Sig's, you know, the deep and kind of, you know, overarching touch points that he had, you know, across this very um, significant period in Chinese history, mm -hmm. to, to again, distill that through his experiences, I think really allows people such a visceral um, understanding of mm -hmm. what that what happened. So it's not just kind of this very abstract idea of, or, you know, very dry kind mm, of um, analysis. Removed, and, um, mm. Analysis, exactly. Mm. That, but it's very, very visceral and very, um, you know, um, direct, I think, mm. in a mm. very effective way. Mm. Um, and I'm yeah, thinking, I think, um, oh, sorry. Please. Uh, um, yeah, I think uh, coming back to his own biography, this, the, the interesting thing is that uh, he was invited by the Chinese uh, to, to come to Beijing, right? That it was not the usual uh, deal where some Westerner uh, tries to uh, make his luck in, out, out there somewhere uh, and offers uh, his uh, jobs or his services or his uh, products. But it was rather that um, in the beginning, the Chinese government had decided we probably have to face urbanization in our country. So sooner or later, we will be, uh, build high rises and therefore we will probably need also elevators. Um, and there was, a, there was a, the idea early that we may uh, need to reconsider the plant economy because it doesn't go very well. That's what some of the more modern thinking uh, technocrats of the Chinese government uh, in the late 70s had realized already at that time. We, we probably have to experiment with our economic experiences by maybe introducing elements of uh, market economy. Uh, but we have to do this in a confined manner that we can also shut it down in case that the virus breaks out and too much of capitalism camps too fast in the country. So it has to be somehow done under controlled condition, like everything in China. In some way, you can say that already 40 years ago, you saw that there was a lot of thinking, there was a lot of analysis, a lot of technocratic decision made before something was decided uh, or, or, or in, uh, implemented. And so um, they decided we have to make experiments with market economy. 
And in order to keep that control, we should probably not go for something very big because if that fails, then a, a major industry is broke and we, we, we can't really uh, survive maybe or get in e a serious trouble. And it shouldn't be a too small industry neither because then you can't really uh, implement it in other sectors. And uh, you want to have probably something which could become a blueprint to similar kind of innovation in other fields of the uh, economy. So that's why they look for a medium-sized industry and elevators were in the eyes of um, the government at that time, such a medium-sized industry. And they were looking around the world, who are the leading companies in uh, this business? And they approached also the Swiss uh, Schindler company as one of these. And um, Uli's sharing the story in the film that they were invited to China. And uh, it was rather the Swiss guy who had some guys, there was a delegation of five or six Swiss people. And he was the young guy who had just joined the company and was not really a businessman but because he was a journalist in the, in the first place. But he had joined that company because his father was there on the board or so. And um, so when the Chinese saw that, uh, at some point, the Swiss guys just wanted to run away because they felt, no, no, that's too complicated. And what a gloomy country and good knows what, and no information. And so actually they were happy. Everyone, they were back home, Switzerland thought that that business is gone. We never go back and that's never going to happen. And then the Chinese came back and said, we would like to make that project with you. And only later they found out that Otis and uh, all the other big players in the, were approached too. But they have chosen the Swiss ones. And why? Because they said, we want to do the deal with you, but only in case that you bring us this young guy. He is the right person for us. We can imagine to talk to work with him. So actually it was Uli Sik who, uh, for some reason, was uh, discovered by the Chinese uh, as someone who has a particular uh, sensitivity um, or, or sensibility and, and a diplomatic uh, instinct on dealing in such a situation uh, with uh, the Chinese government. So he did this. And um, then later, as a diplomat, again, it was for him very important to, to find out um, how um, he can uh, approach China uh, better. Because although he had lived in uh, the 80s already uh, for 10 years in the country, he felt, I'm still missing some major rapport. Um, mm -hmm. Although he spoke in the meantime in Chinese, but I need to find other ways to understand China better. And he felt maybe art is a way to understand China. So the reason why he started collecting art was he wanted to get in touch with artists to understand better uh, the social, maybe political, uh, and of course, artistic condition in China. And he did something what I would always say is uh, one of the, the greatest uh, ideas uh, other collectors should uh, try to adopt. He created an art award, the Chinese Contemporary Art Award in the late 90s. And you have to imagine at that time, uh, there were no magazines, there were no galleries, there were no museums, new cur right. curators, there was sing uh, simply no whatsoever information about contemporary art. Even the artists themselves in the countries didn't know of each other, didn't know what kind of work they would do. There was no display for anything. That, of course, concerned Udisik too. So he didn't know, are there actually any artists in the country? Where are they? What kind of art are they doing, etc.? By announcing this award, uh, he immediately got in touch with a lot of people who heard of uh, about this and approached him. So that was a, a very smart move to gain information about something which was before totally invisible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why um, by introducing this art award, he had suddenly um, contact to hundreds of artists and saw their work and was able to visit them, talk to them. And this is how he created an extraordinary network. And uh, he uh, invited both from uh, the West, but also from China, young people, curators and more senior people and established something like an informal academy of art experts, uh, also Chinese from overseas, like Ho Han Ru, for example, uh, the curator, um, to participate in the selection of the best of the artists uh, he had um, been approached uh, by. So this is how he, in some way, even created a kind of expertise um, in a collective manner. Uh, so, And he benefited from this during his collection. So he, uh, by talking to all these people, 
was able to hone his own understanding of what is actually the quality of contemporary Chinese art or what is maybe particularly relevant. And he always says that the collection is for him something like a document, meaning that's a documentation of uh, what happened in the Chinese contemporary art scene uh, from the beginning uh, up to say 2000 or the early 2000s. But he didn't uh, choose this only um, according to his personal taste, but rather as something which uh, was reflected through many people who are themselves uh, curators, either in Western countries or uh, in China itself later on also. And that's why I think it's a very important point because the discussion in Hong Kong currently goes that there's a Swiss man who is now importing a collection uh, of Chinese contemporary art. That was his private taste. Uh, and we have now to deal with uh, the private taste of a Swiss businessman who allegedly uh, has selected the art world. And that's now supposed to be the Canaan of the contemporary Chinese art. That isn't true. Uh, Uri Sikt rather had created a larger board uh, of uh, people who were able to develop a very collective and diverse expertise. And the result of this discussion is the collection. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think you touch upon a very interesting point. I mean, one, just to go back, I think, you know, perhaps it was his empathy and maybe his, you know, um, the inquisitiveness of a journalist for him to really kind of delve into the culture so deeply, both during his time with Schindler, but also during his diplomatic period to really be open and to kind of do that investigative kind of, you know, thinking and, and kind of getting under, you know, the culture to really understand it fully. But I think you also bring up a really good point in terms of the way that he brought his collection together, because my understanding is that he always envisioned that he would give this collection back to the Chinese people and that the formation of it. And, you know, he says in, in your documentary that he sees it as research. He sees himself as a researcher rather than a collector, that he's really, you know, making sure that he is creating in a way a, a visual time capsule of this very holistic, um, the ideas, again, that you so eloquently lay out throughout the documentary of, you know, the social, economic, political shifts that happen and how that is synthesized through the experiences of these artists and, and, and communicated in their work. And so it becomes this very um, poignant and I think powerful kind of mirror that Uli Sig is shining up, you know, to Chinese culture um, about their recent past, uh, you know, the last half a uh, half century of, mm. of their existence. And, and I think it's such a powerful testament that, you know, he's returning it now to M plus. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that brings us now perhaps then to talk a little bit about your next project together, because mm. I think, you know, you have these two moments in this trilogy. One, I think, again, using the bird nest as a point of um, entry at this very particular moment, because I agree, you know, at the turn of the century, you know, China was really gearing up to open up. I mean, in 2000, it was when the Shanghai Biennial first became international and, and there was all that change. And then kind of going at another angle through the documentary, um, The Chinese Lives of Willie Sig to kind of look back and then bring it even more to the present. Um, through these various facets. And then so now kind of thinking about the culmination of, of Dr. Sig's collecting and his um, deep interaction with the artistic community as a way to, you know, then illuminate aspects of Chinese culture. Um, and so now kind of publicly giving, you know, I think it's what it came up to 2,500 works that he mm -hmm. gave to M plus um, that are, you know, soon to be shown to the public. Um, and so thinking about that and thinking about where, you know, Hong Kong is and where China is and and kind of where the world is now. And, and it would be great to hear how through these many years now, I mean, cause you started, I guess in 2012 with Dr. Sig. So it's almost a decade in working and thinking together about China um, and how to kind of, um, how to translate, you know, the nuances of its evolution through the lens of Dr. Sig's collection and, and his experiences in particular uh, as, you know, 
as a business person, as a diplomat, as a friend um, to the country uh, and, and, pa and patron of the arts, um, how do you, how are you planning to kind of, um, to present the next chapter, or this kind of, of the final act of the trilogy, mm -hmm. as it were? The conversation with Ulysses goes back to the time when we created the first film. So it's probably it was probably two thousand four, three, mm -hmm. four, since we started talking uh, about China and oh, about years, its own then, projects. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's even a longer period, and um, the same applies to Ai Weiwei, um, with whom I'm in touch uh, already since these years, and of course. Uh, we may have uh, had a totally different career than Ulysses, but they both stayed together in some way and always uh, until today have a very close contact to each other and I think are very good advisors to each other also in, in, in many ways, in many projects. Uh, I'm saying that because the film will probably uh, in some way bring them together, even if they even if they don't go together to Hong Kong, which is not very likely. But uh, somehow mm, this story um, will be reflected in the film again. Already in uh, my second film, The Chinese Lives of Odyssey, there's a final chapter with an outlook to um, the um, future in Hong Kong. We are arriving in the film in Hong Kong. We're spending time with there with Odyssey there. I mentioned earlier that. Uh, I lived for 12 years in Basel. Uh, this is another ironic coincidence that uh, Art Basel became, uh, during the time when I was in Basel, uh, the, the, the global probably most important art fair. Uh, and I was very close to the directors at that time who also decided to move to Miami uh, because that happened around the time too when I was in, in Basel. Uh, and Baz became the kind of global brand and decided finally uh, to go to Hong Kong. And we, we have also Art Basel in this uh, second film um, because Art Basel became, to some extent, a, a precursor to um, or a promise to what kind of art hub Hong Kong could become in the future. And in 2016, uh, there was for the first time a show uh, of Uli Sik's work, um, 60 so-called um, highlights of the Sik collection were presented uh, in actually a rather commercial space, which was turned into um, an exhibition space for several weeks uh, during the Art Basel and afterwards. And it was really intriguing to see um, how people embraced that show. Um, there were several, I think 40,000 people in just a few uh, weeks visiting that and many from mainland China also. And uh, it was very well done by M Plus who had uh, hosted that show um, uh, because the deal was done. They, uh, officially they owned already these artworks. Um, so that was the first time that these things were shown and we, sh we have this in the picture too, at least the, 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 the lead up to, to this, those events. Um, and now, of course, the next chapter is what happened since then, because this the film ends in 2016. Now we have five years ahead. I hoped actually to um, have made that film already two or three years ago, uh, because there were several hiccups uh, in Hong Kong with the construction development. Um, there, there was the, the collapse of the contractor, the main contractor, which brought the whole project on hold for uh, in 2018 for quite some time. Um, there were also many difficulties uh, with the neighbor, neighboring uh, terminal of the uh, express railway, uh, which created uh, technically obviously many problems. So that's why there were many delays and now with Corona, uh, even longer delays before the museum is finally um, uh, ready for opening, but now it's going to happen. And of course, I'm very curious what is going to happen because there is now such a long period already that the Hong Kongers look at that site, which is so iconic in the middle of the, of the city, but it's still a black box. Nobody really knows what is going to happen. Uh, and of course, uh, there's a lot of speculation around and that alone is already an interesting narrative for a film to see that the city is looking at something closed up, unfinished for many years, which was very expensive, and uh, so many debates around this, and they don't know what it is and what, what is inside. So the moment that uh, this building, this black box is going to open, many things are going to happen, I suppose. 
and we are, I couldn't resist uh, making a third film about that because in some way it maybe also goes back to the first film about the Olympic Game Stadium. I consider M Plus as an iconic building which stands for, symbolically for a more broader context in terms of where is China today, uh, politically, economically, socially. And that's what I want to show. Um, I want to use um, the museum, uh, the reception of the collection and of the museum, um, the, the way how this resonates in the city and probably also in China, uh, to see what happened actually over the last five years since we left uh, with the second film, uh, China and uh, the art scene in China and in Hong Kong. So that's actually the plan. And um, I think... Um, it is, of course, difficult with the current uh, restrictions to uh, to be there. I, I wish I would be there. Uh, Ulisi currently is there. He made a very bold decision months ago to go to China and never come back. I mean, at least not uh, since now. Um, and um, as we speak, he celebrates his 75th uh, birthday also. So he really made some major decisions for his life. Uh, and it shows also how... Uh, obviously close he is to China that uh, he didn't want to uh, be away from China for a long time. He, that's why I decided rather to be away from Europe for, for uh, quite some time. Um, in order to be able also to follow now the process of the installation, the hanging of the museum, the preparation of the opening. And that's why I'm very keen to see uh, the result. Um, and we will probably go filming in uh, autumn this year when officially the museum is going to open and I'm certainly keen to understand not only what the art experts and the artists have to say about the, uh, the museum and the collection or the architects or the collector and the museum director all of that is important but I'm equally interested to understand what the people of Hong Kong have to say and think and feel looking at this collection I think that uh, will be a very very exciting moment. Well, certainly, I think that M plus will be a bellwether to gauge, you know, how the winds are shifting. And so I think that your documentary will be very um, illuminating and, uh, you know, enlightening for us all. You know, there's so many right. more questions that I would love to ask you. You know, we didn't even touch on the reception of the documentary, you know, in China versus the West. But, you know, I think um, we'll have to invite you back again mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, to present the, the, the third in the trilogy. So, Michael, thank you so much for um, it was your a pleasure. time. It was a pleasure. And it was a pleasure. Expertise. Sure. And you know, we welcome you back uh, to see uh, part three. So thank well, you I would again. Be, I would be pleased to, to talk more about this at some other time. And yeah, I, I hope we will manage um, to make that film. And if so, then uh, in a year from now, it will be available. You will see. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, see you again at Asia Society at the movies. All right. <laughs>